it this way before in this setting. So live. We are live. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm listening to it. I just heard it and she was. Hello. What's up, Mo? How are you? Good, man. Good. How's your day been? Okay then. Okay. Just asking what is what does it sound like so far? It's clear. Okay. All right, good deal. You hear anything from Betty today? No, okay. Okay. Okay, good deal. Good deal. By the way, when you whisper, I can hear you on the live. Mm. Yeah, all of this is a yes, quiet room. Mm. Anybody on there? 15 listeners. Okay. 15 watchers. Okay. Hey, folks, how y'all doing? Hope all is well with you all today. Y'all having a, a good day thus far. Thank y'all for coming in. Definitely appreciate it. Um, we um, are just trying some different venues and the like, so this is a different setting than what you're used to seeing. We are in an undisclosed location. Somewhere very, very far away. <laughs> uh, however, we are delighted that, uh, that you did chime in, so uh, thank you so much for, uh, for calling in. Here's one of the things that I, I'm going to attempt to do, um, and Zach is going to help me with that, is uh, might, I might pause at a certain point to see if you have any questions about what we're talking about, and uh, he's going to be able to uh, articulate those questions, whatever. Um, if you, you know, write, I mean, yeah, you're writing it down, whatever it may be, he's going to see it, and then he'll give it to me, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Same thing, Marvin, on the conference call. Um, we're going to uh, mute it, but then at some point if you all have questions, I'm going to have the phone unmuted where you can pause.
pause and we can pause and interact if we need to. And what I'll be doing in the meantime is just kind of translating what is being said from the conference call to the Facebook and of course from Facebook to uh, to those who are on the other conference lines. Just like ask, asking the question and then giving the answer. So it might take us a little time to get through it, but just want to at least try it uh, to, uh, to get it started. So you guys, for me, it's kind of almost like the guinea pig. It'll be the first time I'm doing that. Um, I have to admit, I am uh, I am really being challenged on some of this stuff. But I'm discovering something. The more we do it, the more we get familiar with it. Uh, and so I'm uh, I'm looking forward to doing it because uh, from every indication, uh, I don't know if you all paid attention to the, uh, or if you heard anyway, the uh, President's Conference uh, today. Um, man, I've never, you know, really hadn't seen him that way. And so it's an indication to me that uh, this thing is more serious, I'm going to say, than uh, what I think he originally thought. And um, But thank God he is taking it serious, concerned again, I believe, overall for our overall welfare. So uh, this is, again, let's just keep that in mind uh, going forward. Um, got about another minute and once that is done, we'll, uh, as I said, Marvin, I'll mute you guys, uh, but you all will have the ability, if you would, if you press star six at any point when I'm muted, if you press star six, you will, uh, you will be able to, uh, to come onto the line. So, uh, so right at seven o'clock, uh, as we always try to do to be honorable with the time that God has given us, we will, uh, we will get started. And I certainly ask for your prayers just to, again, to be able to communicate the glory of God in this, uh, in this manner. Definitely appreciate you all uh, uh, being on the Facebook Live and also on the, uh, the conference call. Bob, you can still hear me well? Yeah, I'm, can you still hear me well? Is it? I'm noticing. Wow. Yeah, I hadn't. They hadn't called me yet. So um, let's just uh, again, if it if it uh, if it gets too too bad, I'm just gonna encourage you just you know hang up and call again to see if it uh you know if it if we get a little clear. It's just what it is. They they did tell us that system is just overloaded. So I do do apologize for that. But in the meantime, again, you're going to hear mute. I'm going to go to a mute sound. And then uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer. You all, uh, if you would, just let's pause for a moment of prayer. And then uh, we're going to go into uh, our, uh, our lesson for tonight. Dear God, we are grateful and thankful to you again for the blessing of life. We thank you, God, for our health, our strength. We thank you again for you allowing us to know you uh, so that we can live in a way that's pleasing to you, God. We uh, pray that as a result of this day that you have been pleased with our service of worship thus far. And Lord, we uh, clearly know that, uh, as always, we rush to ask that you would forgive us of our sins knowing that there are things that we leave undone, some things we should have left undone, knowing that things we said and things that we should not have said, knowing that there are thoughts that we fail to take captive to the obedience of Christ and we allow those thoughts to become actions. And so God, we ask that you would forgive us for all of those things. And then Lord, again, as we're here tonight, we're here for the purpose again of bringing glory to you as uh, you allow us to grow in your word uh, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you, God, uh, for just the opportunity that you have granted us and that you're granting us right now uh, to be able to communicate with one another uh, in this form of technology, in this form of, uh, of di the digital age that we're living in, uh, still more than anything else is to communicate your word, to communicate your truth. So as we're here tonight, Lord, we are mindful of Sister Betty Savannah, who is uh, just really going through a tough time uh, with her breathing and uh, they've been diagnosed with pneumonia and the like. And so, God, I pray for Sister Betty. I pray for a healing, God. I pray for restoration. 
I pray God that you would make her well as only as only you can do. Of course, we never demand you to do anything, but Lord, we shall know how to ask. And we would ask it in Christ's name that you would heal her body. We certainly pray for Reverend Cornelius uh, Williams uh, and his for his family and what they're experiencing uh, as a result of the uh, the virus. But God, thank you that he's on the upswing, that he's doing much better. Uh, he's doing well. The family's doing well. And we just pray you continue to provide your protection uh, and healing uh, for, for that family. Uh, for Lord, those who are on the front line still dealing with uh, various medical uh, issues of persons with coronavirus, those who uh, have been tested positive and the like. We pray for our own uh, members, uh, Eric and Tarankula, uh, Lucretia and Deborah Fiesta and Carmen uh, and Rita, God, you know the issues that they're dealing with on a daily basis. And I just pray again, your mercy uh, will continue to be upon them, Lord, that you would comfort them, uh, help them to know beyond the shadow of a doubt. You love them and you're uh, it really concerned about them. So I pray your protection upon each and every one of them uh, as you would lead, guard, and guide. And as we praying again for our law enforcement, we certainly pray for Daniel Tate in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, who is uh, having to deal with people uh, on a daily basis, not knowing, again, whether they carry the virus or not. But God, what we do know is that you are able to protect and We thank you uh, for what you continue to do in his life. And then our own brother Keith Harris, who is a fire marshal for Harris County for the city of Texas, for his city of Houston. We pray for Keith, God, that you would protect him uh, as he has to uh, still go around checking whether or not people are meeting and, and gathering together. I pray again your continued protection for him, that you would always be leading and guiding him and protecting him and, and walking with him. Help him to know that you are always with him. Again, for every member of our congregation, Lord, for the babies that are yet in their bombers' bellies, uh, to Sister Philomena Thomas, God, I pray again your grace and your mercy be upon us, not only upon us, but every believer all over the world. We pray, God, that you would help us be focused on bringing glory and honor to you uh, in every way possible. And then not only for people uh, who are believers, but I pray for people all over the world, this uh, COVID-19 is... is uh, as the president reminded us, is affecting people over 151 countries in our world. And so, God, I just pray for comfort for those families uh, that have lost loved ones, people that have died, that had to deal with funerals and uh, all of those kinds of issues that are going on. God, I just pray again your grace and your mercy uh, on literally 5,000 people so far. And I just pray, God, that you would comfort those families only as, as you are able to do, Lord. Um, we ask again that you would uh, allow that to be a miracle of healing uh, because we know you still got that kind of power. We pray, God, if that's not the miracle of healing that you would do, uh, that you would just allow it to be rid and gone. But we pray that you would allow that to be a medical cure to be found out uh, sooner than later, Father, that there might be a vaccine that might uh, allow for healing and then uh, something that would protect us going forward for uh, this virus that is, uh, has plagued our world. And then we pray again for the medical personnel. We pray for that protection. We pray, God, that you would keep them, uh, protect them when they're dealing with patients as they got to leave those patients and go to their homes, uh, that their families will not be infected or not affected by it. So I pray, God, you just continue to keep us. Help us with our minds stayed on you, Lord. Help us to always look to the hills from what's coming our help knowing that all of our help ultimately comes from you. We pray again that you would, you would, you would just uh, help us to know again that you said you would never leave us, nor would you ever forsake us. And we do count on that reality, Lord. Now be with us uh, in our time of study on tonight as we go through Matthew chapter 17, uh, looking at the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we pray that you will be glorified uh, in what we say and do for the moments and minutes that are yet to come. Uh, in this particular day. Thank you for the Good Shepherd family. Thank you for every church open in your name. And we pray again, your presence and power would prevail. You said it in your word, uh, that the gates of hell would not prevail against your church. And we do believe that. We see that. We believe it. We trust it. Be with us now. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Uh, once again, it is a, a blessing to uh, to be with you all. And uh, we pray and trust that you have been able to uh, 
to tap into what we're doing. Uh, we did send out an email uh, for an outline that we have for the discussion that we're going to have on tonight. So if you don't, even if you have the outline or don't have it, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, and we're going to look at the first three verses, or first 13 verses, I'm sorry, of Matthew chapter 17 for our edification. We're going to read it, to, uh, read it, uh, and then we're going to, uh, to look at some things that God says to us concerning his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, the bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they there, lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is a, also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. This is, this is the word of God. And if you're looking at the handout, I'm kind of just walking through it, uh, reading through it. This is I had. I, I had the utmost respect for all three of my pastors, uh, namely again, Reverend Abel Johnson here in Houston, Reverend Anazine Wilson. Uh, but through God's providence, my first pastor, Dr. Emil Thomas, was also my last pastor until his death last year. As a child, he was a giant of a man to me. And when I became a preacher, Marcy and I had the opportunity to get close to him and Sister Annie Thomas. Uh, from about 1964 until about 1988, I viewed him as a stern and serious, yet very kind man. Uh, later, we discovered that through and though he was quite serious, we also got to know he had a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, all of those characteristics made him the man he was. However, uh, we never would have known that if he had not allowed us to get close to him. So uh, what I'm saying here is in the, uh, the Jesus early ministry uh, to his disciples, he progressively, you know, kind of pro processionally revealed to himself. He allowed them to be so close that they could fully recognize who he was. Matthew 17 stands out because uh, his original followers, as well as believers today, got a glimpse into the totality of his being. Uh, he stood out in such a way that God the Father commanded that we must hear him. And that's the title of what we're going to deal with tonight, Hear Him. And of course, you know, you recall in the previous a previous statement made by uh, Peter in Matthew 16, uh, verse 16. Uh, notice what he says. Just turn to that for just a moment. Uh, it says, I'm starting at verse 13, just to give us the context. It says, and when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered uh, and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Now, as a result of the revelation of God, the father, notice what he says in verse 18, 18. And 
I also say to you that you are Peter on the basis of the revelation from my father that you could not have gotten from flesh and blood. He says, upon this rock, on this huge revelation that has been given from my father and your understanding of it, Peter, and the other disciples, he says, I will build my church. And here's the promise. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So what's amazing about that is that we have this confirmation, affirmation of Jesus as the Son of God, again, who is who is from God and who to whom he's going to build his church. But he also helps us to understand that in chapter 17, so what does he do? He, 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 he gives further substantiation to the truth. And what, what does he do in that? That get right before their very eyes, God transfigured him before Peter, James, and John, which meant that he was expanding. He was magnifying on what originally happened in chapter 16 to show that Jesus was truly the Christ, the son of the living God. So as we work through the handout, uh, the first thing that we're going to be looking at uh, based on the gospel, and I always keep that in mind that this is, this is uh, the gospel of Jesus, what? According to Matthew. It is not the gospel about Peter, James, and John. It is not the gospel about the woman at the well. It's not the gospel about Nicodemus. It's not the gospel about the three friends that brought the man to Jesus. It is not the gospel of that. It is the gospel of Jesus. And to recognize how Jesus comes close enough uh, to humanity that humanity now is able to literally be changed and transformed. Why? Because Jesus came near to them and they what? They heard him. And so what do we look at? Jesus allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. That's the first thing we look at. Jesus allowed the glory of God the Father to be revealed in him. How do we know that? Look at chapter 17, verse 1. He says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, in verse 2, and he was transfigured. Notice, it didn't say that he transfigured himself. No, it says he was transfigured, which means to us is that Jesus himself allowed himself to be transfigured by the Father. Oh, and I love that about Jesus because John would teach us that everything that Jesus did was dependent on the Father. He would say in John chapter 5, around verse 39, I can't do anything of myself. That is amazing to think that God is saying, I can't do anything of myself. But when he came as the God man, he showed you and I how we ought to live in such a manner that we rely upon him. And so he was transfigured. Uh, it, it, it was a passive thing that was done. It was done to him by the father. He was transfigured, meaning this, that there was a visible change in Jesus. There was a visible change. Uh, yes, John, Peter, James, and John, they knew him. They had been with him for three years. So they knew physically what he looked like. But this was a different experience that they were going through. Because literally, again, what the Bible says, look at his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became as white as the light. Wow. He was literally, um, that was literally a visible change in Jesus, according to verse 1 and 2. And then that was the visiting company from the Old Testament. I like that. Uh, notice in verse 3, it says, Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Ooh-wee. Now, I, I, I said it before, Mr. Shepherd, you know, I always tell y'all that. Don't read these passages. Don't read the scripture like, you know, this is something you see every day. No, 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 no. You don't see nobody walking around and all of a sudden their countenance changes and they, you know, get light. Their face started changing and their clothes started glowing. We don't see that every day. So I always encourage us to be in awe. To be in amazement, what we read about Jesus, because that's what's going to keep us in, in amazement of what we know about Jesus. And we never come to a point that we take him for granted. We don't come to a point like, oh, you know, that ain't nothing. No, no, no. This was absolutely amazing. So what happens? Elijah and Moses show up. Well, Moses again, uh, according to a Deuteronomy 18, around verse 15, uh, up to verse 18, it talks about he was the prophet. Uh, Moses said that he was a great prophet, but that was the prophet that would come. 
ultimately pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at the life of Elijah, uh, Elijah just performed so many miracles uh, in the life of the, the, the children of Israel when they were dealing with idolatry and famine and all kinds of things that were going on. And so now they appear with Jesus and the Bible says that they actually talking to him. I always like to look at that. You know, the, the, the scripture teaches at the end of Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 34, it says that uh, uh, Moses was actually buried by God. You know, he didn't get a chance to go into the promised land because he disobeyed God. Remember when he was supposed to talk to the rock and he hit the rock instead? God said, because you did not honor me, you can't go into the promised land. But boy, when I look at this text, it looked like to me some way God showed his grace and he allowed Moses into the promised land. Why? Because he was right there in the midst of Jesus Christ when Jesus, in this case, is on his way to Jerusalem. He is in the promised land. And so, and so they appear before him and then that was the vocal confusion uh, on the part of Peter. Oh my goodness. Notice what Peter said. Peter get excited. You know, y'all know some people who get excited and they get so excited that they say things out of their head. They say things that don't even really make any sense at that particular time. Notice what Peter says in chapter four. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And what he's doing, he's taking it back into the Feast of Tabernacles where the children of Israel, God would say to the children of Israel, at some point in the year, they were to build some tents. And it was to be a palm leaves and stuff like that because he wanted them to remember that he had brought them out, how he protected them while they were in the wilderness, and they would celebrate that. They would do that for seven days. So Peter is all excited. According to Mark chapter 4, uh, if you're looking again at the, oh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says he really didn't know what to say. He was so excited about what was going on that he really didn't know what to say. But the scripture says that that, that was vocal co co confusion on the part of Peter that he is so excited. He said, man, let's just stay here for a while. But it, it was very, very clear that that wasn't Jesus' intention. That was not God's intention because notice what happened. That was the verbal verification of the son by the father. Look at verse 5. It says, while he was still speaking, while Moses, well, I'm sorry, while, while Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Peter, James, John, Jesus, Moses, Elijah, and suddenly a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Notice what he says, hear him. I love that. I love that. I love that. What God is doing now is affirming the reality of his son. That was already, God revealed it to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, but now God is verbally affirming his son, verbally declaring who Jesus is, that he is saying, he is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And all he says, hear ye him. I love that, y'all, because what he's, what he's pointing out, that there is no one, no one, and that, that kind of leads to the last thing, that was the veneration, if you would, uh, of the son and the father by the disciples. Because notice what happens in verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. That was a, literally an act of worship. They are prostrated. They are falling down. Why? Because they have heard the voice of God. They have seen this, this transfiguration of Jesus. And then they have literally seen the presence of Moses and of Elijah. And so, yeah, they are greatly afraid. They have to be. They are amazed. In other words, it was reverence. It was respect. And I just want to encourage us, anytime we think of Jesus, anytime we think of God, it's important to have that kind of reverence and that kind of respect. Remember, I think I told y'all the other day, let's never ever, ever consider him the man upstairs or the big guy in the sky, all of that kind of thing. No, he is Jesus. He is the son of God and he is worthy of all reverence, of all respect. He is God himself. And so he de deserves to be revered by us. And so we looked at Jesus allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. But the second thing, well, before I do that, before I go into that, let me let me pause and find out. Does anyone have a question? Those of you that are on Facebook right now, do you have any question based upon the passages that we've already looked at from verse 1 uh, up to um, verse number 6? 
Does anyone have any kind of question? For those of you on Facebook, I'm going to see first. Now, uh, while I'm doing that, I'm also going to uh, and ask for those of you who are listening to the conference call, if you would just press star six, that will unmute. And if you have a question, we want to address your question. Either one, Facebook or the conference line. I know it's new, new for you all too, so don't be scared. Don't be scared. I'm sorry. Don't be afraid. Uh, anyone? All right. Well, if there is no one right now, I'm going to keep going forward. But uh, if you decide you want to uh, make a comment, again, ask a question, please feel free to do so. Allow a few more seconds if anybody will choose to. Online. Uh, on Facebook, on the conference call. All right, well, let's look at the second point. Uh, we said, number one, Jesus allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him, and that's in verse one through six. Here's the second thing. Jesus addressed his disciples in light of what was revealed of him. Uh, look at verse seven. It says, but Jesus came and touched them and said, arise and do not be afraid. So what do we, what do we see here? He came so close he came close enough to comfort them. Doesn't that sound like our Lord? Doesn't that sound like Jesus? He came close enough to them to comfort them. He didn't scream at them. He didn't holler, hey, y'all get up. Uh, you know, y'all some... No, no, no. He came close enough. He touched them. He showed compassion toward them. And he said to them, do not be afraid. And listen, I, I want to say that same kind of pause and slow down right now. Listen, there's a lot going on in our world that's so disturbing uh, this this COVID-19 thing is a terrible thing. It absolutely is. But at the same time, Jesus is saying to us, uh, as he speaks to us, as we hear him, he is saying to us, still, do not be afraid. It reminds us in the word of God, worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God will surpass all understanding. It will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we got to trust that because he is concerned about us. First Peter chapter 5 tells us, cast all of your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And you have to know that, brothers and sisters. So Jesus is exemplifying that. The second thing, look at verse 8. It says, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. That is wonderful. He came close enough to, to, uh, to comfort them, but he caused them to see that no one compared with him. I love that. That's what God the Father allowed. That here it is. Here it is. I'm slowing down. I'm slowing down. I'm slowing down. I get I got Somebody asking me a question. Yes, sir. To Peter's engine. Where were the other disciples? Yes. No, no, no. That that he's still referring. Uh, Brother Elder is asking a question when it says that he went up on the mountain and he took Peter, James, and John, and then he makes a reference to the disciples. Uh, he's asking, does that represent all of the disciples? No, he's really still referring, Brother Elder, to Peter, James, and John. So all the scripture, all, all Matthew is doing is identifying that it was still those three that were up on the mountain with him. Good question. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Thank you for calling. All right. So now, when he does that, notice what happened. He caused them to see that there was no one compared with him. I love that. I love that. Because notice what happens. They're up on the mountain. His head is glowing. His clothes is glowing. Moses show up. Elijah show up. God the Father is speaking. But then when the smoke clears, when the voice is gone, the only one that's standing is Jesus. Wow. That's important. That's significant. Why? Because of what the Father had just said. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. God had never said that about any of the, any of the prophets. He's saying hear 
him because what it is showing the fulfillment of everything else that every other prophet ever talked about was really characteristic of Jesus Christ. That's why Hebrews chapter 13 would say Jesus Christ what is the same yesterday, today and forever. Even when Mo when Noah was preaching to the people that uh, that God is going to going to hold back uh, 120 years, and at, at the end of 120 years, there won't be no more flesh on the earth except for eight people that survive. Even Noah preached in the spirit of Jesus Christ because who is Jesus Christ? John would say to us, he is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So everything that the prophet spoke ultimately was, ty it was typically or a typology of really Jesus as the living word. And so he says, hear him. And when the smoke cleared, the only one that was standing was Jesus. And then notice that the other thing that he does. He commanded them to keep the revelation. That's what Jesus did. He commanded them to keep the revelation until after the resurrection. I love what he does in verse 9. And it says, and now as they came down from the mountain, and we're talking about as they came down, he's talking about Jesus Peter, James, and John, the ones who originally went up on the mountain with him in verse 1. As they come down, he says, tell the vision to no one, watch this, until the Son of Man will restore, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. I love that. I just, I just love that because here it is, they're having this exciting experience with Jesus Christ. But he's already at this point forecasting resurrection. He is already forecasting the fact he's going to die he, or he's going to suffer. He's going to die, but he's going to be risen from the dead. And he would say to his disciples, this thing that you just saw, Peter, James, and John, you're not to share this with the other nine. And of course, don't even share with the other eight when it got down to, you know, when Judas had betrayed him, all of that kind of thing that's going on. But he says, don't tell anybody. And here's what I love about that, because there actually came a time as John is writing in 1 John, he says, he says, he talked about Jesus. He says, we heard him, we saw him, we handled him, even the very word of life. And so it was, it was, it was showing that they actually kept God's command. Peter talked about it in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 2, uh, at the end of chapter 1, I'm sorry. He talked about the fact we saw him in his glory. We saw him on the mountain, this word of truth that was expressed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's already forecasting his resurrection. And isn't that like Jesus that he gives these hints along the way that, yes, I came to die, but I also came to be risen from the dead. All right, so we were at the end, if you would, of that of that second point, um, uh, in verse 9. Uh, and so I want to pause again. If anybody have any questions from verse 1 to verse 9 so far in terms of what we talked about, any questions or comments? For those of you that are listening by the conference line, all you got to do is just press star uh, 6. And that will open up your line. And if you want to mute it again, you just press star six again. So anybody, first of all, on the conference line, want to ask a question or make a comment. And whatever you say, I'll make sure that everybody else uh, uh, understands it. All right. Anybody on Facebook, maybe have a question, a comment that you want to make. And we'll make sure we articulate that so that everybody else can hear it. I wonder how many of <clears throat> I wonder how many of us what she said would not have shared it anyway. Would not have shared it anyway. Oh my goodness, how many of us would not have shared it? <laughs> well, it, the bottom line, it's the same thing. It's it's uh understanding that it was a command that was given by Jesus. He had a reason for it. And so those who would be his followers uh, at that point, he didn't want it to be shared. But then what we do, we don't understand. We live in a time that, hey, he's not telling us not to say anything now. And unfortunately, he's telling us to say it, and sometimes we don't say it. In this case, it was necessary, uh, just in terms of where he was, what he was about to do, that no one would know what took place because he just wanted it to be that way because he chose to reveal it to Peter, James, and John, and here's what's amazing about that. When you read about those brothers in the book of Acts, these were the ones who were the initiators, if you would, of the church. Isn't that amazing? That, that it shows us that even though Jesus had 12, there were three of them that were extremely close to him. And those were the ones that he actually used to establish the church when we read, especially in the, uh, the book of Acts. 
Any other question? Any other comment? Anybody on the online on the conference call? All right, thank y'all so much. Y'all, y'all see, I'm smiling. I'm starting to get this. I'm actually enjoying this. Praise the Lord. All right, all right. Let's look at the last thing. First of all, we said Jesus allowed the glory of God to be revealed in him. Then Jesus addressed his disciples in light of what was revealed of him. And then here's the final thing. Jesus affirmed with great proof that he was re- what was revealed about him. So here's what we look at. Uh, and that starts in verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Good question. So so notice what Jesus does in verse 11. Jesus answered and said, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. That is just absolutely amazing. All right. So how is it Elijah has come, Elijah is come, and then Elijah will come? My goodness that's pretty that's pretty awesome but only God can make that work out so here's what Jesus did he consented with the scribes about the coming of Elijah in verse 10 and verse 11 now what do I mean by that he consented with them in in, in uh, uh, saying that uh, he is come first meaning that uh, 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 the scripture predicted in Malachi chapter 4 if you read the last three or four verses of Malachi chapter 4, it predicted that there would be one who would come as Elijah, who would be a messenger, and that messenger actually would come to do what? To communicate the, thir- the things concerning the kingdom of God. Wow. He would be the forerunner of the Messiah. He would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Uh, he would be the one that would uh, that would ultimately uh, be, be known as the one who would present himself in such a manner that people would know that there's one who was coming at them. This is what he, John the Baptist actually said. One who is coming after me, who's mightier than I, who's shooshed out. I'm not even worthy. So remember, John came to, to pave the way for the coming of Jesus Christ, for the coming of the kingdom of God. But ultimately, they rejected John. They didn't believe in what John said. So Jesus consented to the fact, yes, Elijah is coming. But notice what he says in verse um, 12, but I say to you that Elijah has already come. He has come already. And they did not know him, uh, uh, but did to him whatever they wished. Wow. So what it's saying, that he did come as Elijah. He, come, he did come proclaiming the kingdom. He did come representing God. But what did they do? They mistreated John the Baptist. Uh, they would they would ask him who was he who gave him the authority to do what he did and he would challenge them he matter of fact he would refer to them as brood of vipers at one point you know who warned you to flee from the wrath to come because he was establishing the fact that beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was coming to pave the way for Messiah but they rejected him even to the point that Philip who was actually uh, 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 one of the governors of that time in the area of Judea, uh, had John the Baptist beheaded because John the Baptist warned him that the woman that he married, he never should have had her. So he was beheaded as a result of his belief. And so Jesus is already saying, Elijah has come, but he has come in the person of John the Baptist. Because what did he do? He came proclaiming the word of God. So what he's saying is still, Hear him because John has already come, but they rejected him. And so he cleared the confusion about Elijah based upon John the Baptist. And then finally, what did he do? He concluded that like John, he would suffer evil. He would conclude it. Notice again what he says in verse, back to verse, back to verse 12, the, in the B clause of verse 12. Likewise, the son of man is also about to suffer at their hands. The same ones that had 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 that ridiculed John the Baptist, uh, mistreated him as he's preaching and teaching and baptizing in the Jordan River. Jesus is saying those same ones 
that ridiculed and persecuted and mistreated John the Baptist, not only them, but you know all of the prophets that had come generationally, the nation of Israel had rejected John and they ultimately were now rejecting the, the, the Messiah. Jesus is saying the same ones that, that, that caused John pain are the same ones that gonna that's gonna uh, uh, cause me. I'm going to suffer at their hands because they refuse to hear Jesus. They rejected him. They, they, they just stone cold rejected him. And so this is the thing I would encourage us today. Let's hear him. Let's hear Jesus. Let's hear Jesus. And so in, in conclusion, practically speaking, here's what I want to share with you before we leave. I challenge us to stop listening to ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, and Fox, uh, or whatever your preference may be so much. I'm not saying don't listen to them, but I'm saying don't, don't take all of your time listening to those talking heads. And I say that because some information that they're giving is good. But listen, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pretty much be the same. It's going to pretty much be the same thing over and over and over again. So I just want to challenge you for at least one hour. Uh, in the days to come, don't listen to the talking heads of the world. Don't, don't cut them off. Hear him. Listen to Jesus. I would encourage you to read um, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. He says, you know, it reminds us that, that God in various times and in various ways in the past time, he spoke to us through the prophets. He says, but in these times, he has spoken to us through his son. We have to listen to Jesus. We have to hear him. We have to hear him. So here's a personal challenge. Turn off your digital devices. Turn off your digital devices. Uh, pick up your paper copy of the Bible. And I know I know some of y'all paper copies are dusty right now. Oh, my goodness. It's been so long since you've used them. You've been using the digital. And I'm not against using the digital. But what I'm saying is I would encourage you to put down the digital, turn off the television, and just grab your scriptures, grab the Bible, the paper, turn it in. Read that for yourself and listen to what God has to say to you. And recognize that everything he says ultimately is the word of God and the, re the, re the revelation of the word of God, the fulfillment of the word of God is in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Listen, we're going to be listening, hearing things for a long, long time about COVID-19, the coronavirus, looking for a vaccine, looking for a cure. We're going to hear about uh, unemployment. We're going to hear about all of these things. But more than anything else, folks, I want to, us to saturate ourselves with hearing him. Because when we hear him, it's the most important thing we can hear, the most significant thing we can hear, the most encouraging thing that we can hear. Because, because God has given us Jesus as a source of comfort for us. I want to encourage you uh, as we go forward. Hear him. Uh, take time to listen to others. Know what's going on as best you can. But make sure that what you hear from others, make sure you always filter it through what Jesus has said. Because God wants us to hear him. Father, how we love you and thank you just for this opportunity again to share your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we move forward, it would be our desire to hear Jesus, um, to speak to our hearts so that we can be comforted, so that we can be wise, so that we can be bold and courageous in the face of the adversities that we're looking at, living according to the promise that he would never leave us, nor would he ever forsake us. So here's what I want to ask you Anybody has any question, any comment, here is your opportunity. Again, if you're on the uh, conference line, star six, any question or comment you have, please address it. Anyone at all? Anyone on Facebook? You have any question or comment? I hope in some way you've been encouraged tonight. Hopefully, maybe again, you listen this morning. This is going to be on YouTube. Uh, you can hear it again for your own edification. It's going to be there anytime that you want to, want to do it. Uh, we are still trying to make some plans in terms of what we're going to do moving in the future. Right now, we're going to still use the conference line, those kinds of things to help us. Listen, until we meet again, I love you. And Lord willing, you'll see me Sunday morning. God bless you until we meet again. I love you. Bye-bye. Good night.